Hi there, this is Greg with Zenata Consulting. Today, I've got some tips on how you can improve your error handling in your deluge functions. Please remember to like and subscribe to the Zenata YouTube channel, and let's jump right into the video. The first thing that uh, you can do to improve your functions inside of the CRM desk or books is using standalone functions. Standalone functions are ways that you can compartmentalize and sort of section off pieces of code, especially if that code is going to be repeated a number of times. I'll show you some examples on our screen here. I have some standalone functions uh, that are catered to specific tasks that I'm going to need to perform over and over, perhaps part of different automations. Uh, for example, creating a sales order from CRM line item IDs, or getting the custom field API names from a Zoho project, or even something as generic as encoding a JSON map to be put into a URL string. The benefit of these standalone functions is that it allows you to uh, work on a particular piece of code without it affecting other pieces of code. Also, this code can be repeated and placed in other spots, uh, so you don't have to copy and paste whenever a new change has to be made. You make the change in one spot, and it's reflected everywhere that that code is used. Another big benefit of using standalone functions is that on any one of the functions, you can actually turn on REST API for that particular function, so that even if you want to use this function from outside of the CRM, you can do so. You can turn on uh, an OAuth2 connection, or even use an API key so that you can hit this standalone function endpoint from anywhere on the internet, perhaps in WordPress or Zapier or uh, a personal app that uh, you or a third party has developed. The possibilities, literally endless. The reason why using standalone functions can help with your error handling is that when things go wrong, it becomes much easier to see where things are going wrong. If you can see that the error occurred within the standalone function, then you know the problem is in there. And you just need to make sure that that one piece, given an input, gives you the expected output. That way, anything that has to be debugged or perhaps even new features that need to be later added, you can ensure that the rest of your code will continue to function the same way that it has previously because it's been decoupled. The second tool that we have at our disposal for improving our error handling is using a combination of if-else statements and try-catches. So you've probably used an if-else statement before in Deluge. That's where you have a condition set up to check a certain condition. If that condition is true, execute a piece of code beneath. And then you can add else or if-else statements to create various scenarios, ultimately one default scenario, or maybe nothing happens at all. These are uh, very effective when you're trying to uh, account for errors that you suspect might happen. For example, I might suspect in this function of creating a sales order, something goes wrong while I'm trying to pull this uh, item info. So I set up a if statement to check if I see an item ID in there, which I should see if my function call went correctly. If I see that something is not right, now I know I have an error, now I have to decide what I want to do with it. Well, this is where the try catch comes in. A try catch is something that handles a runtime error. When I say a runtime error, I mean the kind of thing that when you try to run this function, you get uh, a little red message on your console window saying that something went wrong. For example, trying to uh, read something from an empty object or getting uh, an element of a list from uh, a spot that is beyond the size of the list or trying to divide by zero in mathematics. These kinds of runtime errors, if they are happen inside of a try, then the code will stop running anything that's inside of that try and immediately jump down to the catch where we have this little parameter here uh, this can you actually name whatever you want. Uh, this is just where the actual red text that would have appeared on the console window will be stored to that variable. And then this part in between the catch is what gets executed only if the try was triggered by a runtime error. So in here, I can create error statements to make it easier for me to tell what's going on if something does go wrong. So the nice thing about using try catches along with if else statements is that using the if else statements can help you account for 
errors that you expect might occur. The unknown is always possible. So using a try catch helps you uh, anticipate when an unexpected error might happen and you can provide additional context to yourself inside of that try catch to more quickly find out what went wrong with a particular runtime. When it comes to handling those errors, there's a few different options. If I'm using my try catches, one option is I can use this throws execution. So what the throws does is it basically creates a custom instance of that red error text that shows up on a console window and displays whatever it is that I've written here. Now, in the case of a try catch, when I do this throws, that triggers the cat and will jump right down to here. Uh, so here, what I've done is I've said that if the item ID check is false, then I'm going to throw this error statement, this exception called no items were found matching the criteria. That triggers the catch, and the E in this instance is going to contain no items were found matching the criteria. So I add that to an errors map with the label of item info, since that's the API call that this is related to. Another option I'll show you further down here is I could also simply inside of my try catch just add an error statement into a running map of error logs that I can display at the end of my function, right? Here I've created at the top a infos map and an errors map. And as I go through my function, if I see something that could go wrong, I'm going to add it to my errors map. And if there's something that I think would be good to just know, or something that could help provide additional context in the event of an error down the line, I'm going to add that to this infos map. And then here I can show both the errors and the info statements at the same time. Now the nice thing about doing this is that now when I execute my function, now I get to see what went wrong first, right? So rather than having to scroll through a bunch of info statements to try to see what went wrong and what didn't go wrong, everything that did go wrong, I see straight up at the top. And I have a little label here, create sales order. So that's referring to this API call here. And I can see that the error was invalid value passed for organization ID. Uh, well, I'll say that that certainly makes sense since the org ID that I've put in here is just a bunch of X's. Also down here, I have my info uh, statements. Now, admittedly, at first glance, this looks a bit messier because it's all a bunch of JSON jumbled up together. However, because I've put everything inside of one giant infos map, I can double click or triple click sometimes. There we go. And if I copy that and take that into a JSON viewer, then now I have a much more organized way of looking at all of my info statements. Right? I can see all of the labels for my info statements. All of the items within are now properly nested and uh, organized. So there's a lot less hunting and pecking, or even better, I can uh, use a search functionality in a JSON viewer uh, to quickly find a particular info statement that I might be looking for, or a particular piece of data that I know I should expect to see, and if it's missing, then I know that's the problem. The third tip that I have for you is, now that we've created these lovely error info statements, what should we do with them? And so my tip, is to export these errors and infos into some kind of repository or database of your function's execution history. So down here at the bottom of my function, I've added some uh, lines of code to compile all the errors and info statements that I've put together. And I'm putting them in one big map called log. So I have my infos, my errors, I have the execution time of when this happened, uh, and then I'm also including the name of the function. In this case, create sales order. Then I'm going to add that to a list and I'm going to use the Zoho Analytics API to actually import that into an existing table in Zoho Analytics. So inside of Analytics there, I can keep uh, a running log of all of the times that this function is executed, whether it be successfully or with some kind of error. And so I can then go into analytics and set up all sorts of uh, reports and see how well is a function performing. Uh, I could also uh, set up uh, alerts or uh, some kind of email report to send myself any error logs where the errors portion is not empty, meaning something is going wrong. Using your standalone functions can allow you to decouple and compartmentalize 
your functions in a way that uh, makes it easier to work on things piece by piece rather than one giant function uh, where one thing could go wrong in any of the 300 lines of code. Also, using if else statements for attempting to catch anticipated errors and then encasing things in try catches for catching those unanticipated errors. Lastly, we want to take any of those errors or statements or info logs and rather than just displaying them using the info console window, we want to put them in a dedicated list and map that we can then either info in the console window ourselves or better yet, export to another database or repository so that it can be viewed or reported on later. Well, that's gonna do it for today's uh, short video. If you found this helpful, uh, we would appreciate a like and subscribe as it helps out the channel and helps get videos like this in front of other people that need them. And if you have any questions after this video, please head over to club.zanata.com and join our online community there. There you can ask uh, follow-up questions about this video, perhaps other topics that you would like to see. If you don't feel like doing that, you can always just leave something down in the comments below. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you find this useful and we'll see you in the next video.